Hey everybody, welcome back to Carpool Chats. I'm John Eichberg with the Fuels Institute. Today we're joined by Steve Presmitsky with Argonne National Laboratory. Steve is a member of the board of the Fuels Institute, known him a long time. And uh, Steve, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thanks a lot, John. How's it going? So how long have you been at Argonne now? I have not been at Argonne very long. I've been there since October of last year. So that's just about nine months. All right, so you finally uh, found out where the bathroom was? Uh, you know what? It's funny you mentioned that. I don't have a bad yet because I haven't physically been there. <laughs> I'm working That's out of my basement in Northville, Michigan. If you don't know, That's it's right. about 10 minutes north of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yeah, I guess starting a new job during the pandemic changes the yeah. whole onboarding process, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a little tough, to be honest. It's uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, we- luckily, I had a lot of experience working with Argonne. I used to work at the Department of Energy. I used to work for one of their competitor labs. And when I was working at our uh, Ramco, the uh, oil company, I mm-hmm. actually also had projects running with Argonne. So I, I already knew most of the people there. familiar with it. It made it a lot easier. Mm-hmm. So for those of those out there in the audience watching that don't know what Argonne is, can you kind of give us the quick boilerplate of who ANL is? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so uh, Argonne National Lab is one of the U.S. Department of Energy's national laboratories. So those of you don't know, there's uh, 17 different national laboratories around the United States with different missions. Argonne happens to be uh, one of the larger ones. It's also one of the oldest ones. It may be, I think it actually is the original one. Um, celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. And it was originally born out of the Manhattan Project and it was for developing nuclear energy. But now we've got a lot of work. We uh, do basic science work. We're actually from the Office of Science. So we work on materials, some more fundamental things, um, science based. And I'm on the applied side. So I'm in a division called Energy and Global Security, which is much more applied work. And that's how mm-hmm. we get into the transportation technologies. Okay, so what are the, some of the key things that Argonne's worked on? I've, I've worked with Argonne quite a while through the Department of Energy's co-optimization project. <clears throat> but now that you're there, you kind of got the lay of the land in terms of the workload that's going on. What are some of the projects that seem to be the most exciting for you from a transportation perspective? Yeah, so on a transportation perspective, I think the excitement is more, um, the new focus has changed. The new administration has come in and the focus has shifted uh, you know, right now they've made a big push towards uh, tackling climate change. Uh, mm-hmm. So part of the way to do that is what is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the United States is transportation. So they have a goal to decarbonize transportation. Uh, there's no simple solution. There's no silver bullet. So it's really all hands on deck, every technology we can get. Uh, and it's still an incredibly difficult task. So some of the things we're working on, and it's not just battery technology, developing new batteries or electric vehicles. There's hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, connected and aut- um, autonomous vehicles actually play a role. And uh, so one thing that we're going to do at Argonne is just sort of also think about it as like a system of systems. So it's not just I develop a technology by itself, because that leads to some diversity in technology, which is great, but that doesn't mean it's the most optimal system. You may actually put technology into the wrong positions. So one of the things Argonne's very, very good at, probably one of the leading labs at, is the modeling of such things, um, all the way down to single component level, vehicle level, local traffic level, and then you start integrating in beyond traffic, uh, electric grid, uh, some of these other city planning, you know, new new city ideas. Um, how can you adjust your parking spaces when you have autonomous vehicles, things like that? And I think you, you said the key thing for me is there's no one solution. There are some out there who think electrification is the only thing we need to be talking about, but there's so many different sectors of the transportation market that can't all be electrified, at least not easily, that could benefit from other technologies and other solutions, whether they be even liquid fuel solutions or whatever. Um, I think it's important that we continue having a discussion where we're we're exploring all of our options. Because once you put all your eggs in one basket, that basket's going to fall and break. You can't put, you can't do that. So um, what are some of the other things you guys are working on? You mentioned hydrogen, but what are the things like, I mean, I know Argonne's got their fingers in almost everything going on. Yeah. So one thing is you mentioned battery electric vehicles. So a lot of people think that, yeah, I'm just going to electrify and I'm done. Well, you have to remember electric vehicles, <laughs> they work pretty well in light duty. They work very well if you don't have to go very far. Um, and as the batteries get cheaper and you can put a, more batteries into a vehicle for the same cost, because I think that's actually the trend. It's not to lower the cost of the vehicle. We're going to get to a certain range, probably about 300 miles or so. Um, So eventually that may be a very good solution for a vast majority of people in the United States. 
Um, there's always going to be outliers, but the one areas that are a little tougher is uh, heavy duty, yeah. aviation, marine, locomotives. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of people, so I don't want to say neglected them, but they didn't put as much thought into them because light duty was a bigger problem at the time. Uh, and they also just thought, oh, it's impossible to electrify an airplane. And it's impossible to electrify a heavy duty truck. I would never say it's impossible. There's greater challenges, uh, which means you're going to have to do different things. So, for instance, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, uh, you can refuel them quickly on par with gasoline. Still have a little bit of a range issue because it's a compressed gas. Um, we're not going to use liquefied hydrogen on road, most likely, but maybe in other areas. Uh, but there are some things you can do. Uh, really, the primary problem right now is cost. So a lot of things that we're working on is to try and make the technology more robust and more cost effective. And a lot of that comes down to also the hydrogen production. That's not necessarily a big focus area for Argonne, but it is for other national labs as well. Um, we yeah, get into yeah. aviation, two exciting areas that we're really focusing on. Sustainable aviation fuels. Um, and then there's one that people don't really talk too much about, low carbon aviation fuels. So Sustainable aviation fuels is the ones where you want to get the really, really large carbon reductions. These are from biofuels. You can call them synthetic fuels, e-fuels, which is a, from a CO2 or some other source, mm -hmm. converted into a hydrocarbon. Uh, so that, that's exciting for us. Uh, there's also uh, low carbon aviation fuels, which is basically from conventional sources, how are you going to lower the carbon footprint? And this could be different carbon sources. This could be mixing with biomass. This could be just different crude oils processed differently. Uh, so that's all exciting. And then also when you want to talk about fuels, you're going to marine. For a while there, I'd say everyone thought, okay, I'm just going to go to natural gas. Right. Uh, I'm going to put LNG in my tankers because at the time everyone <laughs> thought LNG, we're just going to be you know, transporting LNG around the world for power. As the cost of other renewable electric or cost of any renewable electricity has gone on, such as solar and wind, the need to transport large amounts of LNG, liquefied natural gas, around the world is decreasing. And also, the greenhouse gas benefit you get from natural gas and marine is actually not very small. In some cases, it's arguably worse than the alternative um, heavy fuel. So one thing people talk about a lot is uh, hydrogen. Okay, Putting hydrogen on a ship, this one you're most likely going to liquefy it. Uh, you're going to burn some of it to power the ship. That's, that's one option. Another one is uh, green ammonia. They call it green because it's ammonia made from renewable sources. High energy density, easy to liquefy. Uh, for on, on ships, other off-road applications, it's, it's probably a viable option. Um, not really recommended for in city centers and such because of the, uh, the dangers of, of handling ammonia if there's an accident. But, but all of those, uh, I mean, Argon, we, we're lucky. We get to work on a broad range of things, including all the way down to the very fundamental projects of, say, um, electrolyzer, electrochemistry, if you want to get really down into the weeds. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's interesting you bring this up. I just saw an article this weekend um, about hydrogen and the use of ammonia in transportation, for, especially for marine transportation. And it comes down to, you mentioned cost earlier. You know, one of the things that I brought to the fuels industry when we first kicked it off was this concept that no matter how green or how sustainable a, an initiative is, if it's not cost efficient, it's going to fail. And so you have this this balance between we need to be aggressive in reducing emissions, GHG emissions and criteria pollutant emissions, but we also have to do it in a way that's not going to hurt consumers financially. Otherwise, they're going to, they're going to break. The, the third element that needs to go into is scalability. When we start thinking about converting the marine travel to an ammonia-based fuel, that's going to require exponentially greater amounts of ammonia to be produced. And so we need to take that in consideration. The concept that a one-size-fits-all strategy will work is, is a failed strategy, but they also putting your, your hopes in something that we can't scale. And I look back, you know, 15 years ago when we started talking about biofuels and the idea of a cellulosic biofuel, which fantastic for the environment, um, the scalability at a price competitive point has been extremely challenging. And it's always kind of stayed at this, maybe at some point, hopeful for the future, but we haven't gotten to that marketability side yet. So I think what you guys are doing, trying to figure out how do we solve the problem in a pragmatic way is absolutely essential to success. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, 
there's a saying I've heard it multiple different ways from multiple different people, so I can't attribute it to any individual, but every consumer likes to think they're green, but in reality, they're about as green as their wallets. Um, and <laughs> I think you may be paraphrasing me when back in the, back in the day when I was <laughs> lobbying, um, we were talking about E85 and we would survey consumers, Hey, would you pay more for an, an E85 that's you know renewable? Blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pay 25, 50 cents more because I want to be green. Like, yeah. But when it comes down to filling up their tank, the only green they care about is in their wallet. And it absolutely is true that consumers, it has to be financially advantageous for them to shift their behavior. Otherwise, they're comfortable just doing what they've been doing all along. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, a perfect example is electric vehicle sales. There's a lot of people who would love to buy an electric vehicle. They would love to be environmentally friendly. They want to do the right thing. Um, and it comes down to it, in some cases... Currently, electric vehicles tend to be, uh, I'd say, slightly more expensive, and their offerings are not as many. Right. So for some people, they can't find what they want, or they can't afford it, or they just simply choose to not spend the money on it. Obviously, um, people that are buying the more expensive six-figure electric vehicles, uh, money is not as big of an issue for them. So they have a more of a luxury to choose what they want. And in some cases, they may not even be choosing it for environmental reasons. They may be choosing it just because it's a status symbol or an image thing. Yeah. But when we get into the heavy duty, the marine and aviation, now we're really talking about decisions that aren't made on emotion. They're made on business um, justifications. So it has to actually make financial sense. And because businesses are in business to make money, they don't care about their necessarily the fashion of the different technologies. Right. And so one thing we found out from talking to different people, especially in the heavy duty industry, is there are actually alternatives already out there. There have been for years. But a lot of fleets cannot make them make sense for a variety of reasons. So one thing DOE has done, and we're one of the national labs that are hopefully going to support this, is uh, they announced uh, last week Hydrogen Earthshot, where they're going to try and get the price of hydrogen down to $1 per one kilogram in one decade. Wow. So $1 per one kilogram is about a gallon of gasoline equivalent, a little less than diesel. Uh, and so that would be basically if you said, I can give you something that will give you in a light duty vehicle greater efficiency for hydrogen fuel cell at a dollar a gallon equivalent. And remember, this is deliver this is not taxed. This is not the same as going to the pump and getting gas for a dollar. We know this. We're in fuels and suit. We know this is a big difference. Um, and then on diesel, one thing about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles is a, a, a diesel is a little tougher competitor because the engine in a diesel is much more efficient than the engine in your you know, sedan or your now guys, it's your SUV or CUV that you drive on. Yeah. And the fleets are almost entirely driven by total cost ownership. So they're worried about the upfront costs, the maintenance costs, the fuel costs, which is a big one. Driver's costs, of course, are big ones. And then a lot of people forget they have a resale cost. And the resale cost is one where you get hurt sometimes on these newer technologies, because if it's not a ubiquitous fuel, <clears throat> say a diesel or gasoline, you can't just sell it Anywhere, for instance, I can't sell a million mile truck down to Mexico if it's a hydrogen fuel cell truck. Not today. I can do that with diesel and recoup a little bit of my losses. So there, there are some issues to overcome. Um, but like we said earlier, I think it takes all technologies, all hands on deck. We're going to look for a lot of diversity in the technologies, a lot of diversity in the portfolio and try and get it out there. And the market will sort of figure out and decide what it wants to buy um, as much as the government or state governments, local governments, federal government wants to push technologies. We all know incentives can only carry you so far. Eventually, the technology that makes sense will make sense. Yeah, and I think, you know, you mentioned fleets. Fleets are, they're focused on the ROI and on the logistics. So if it costs me more money, I'm not going to do it. If it delays my operations, I'm not going to do it. But they are a lot more pragmatic and numbers focused than your consumer is. I was having a conversation earlier with some colleagues about the if we're going to go to mass adoption of a new technology, say it's electric vehicles, we have to develop the offers where consumers feel compelled to change. Because quite frankly, you're shifting from one vehicle to another. They're right. giving you the exact same service. The yeah. EV is a total cost of ownership advantage, but it has that inconvenience of taking a long time to charge. And so for the consumer to feel, yeah, I, I need to make this change. It has to be so, such a compelling uh, benefit to them. And a lot of people like to point out, you know, the smartphone revolutionized everything and they compare that to an EV. 
And my response, or any technology for vehicle, my response is the vehicle is a different animal. You are substituting for a like technology that carries with it maybe cost advantages, but doesn't necessarily improve the convenience of your life. Whereas that smartphone, huge transformational quality in terms of quality of life and your ability to do things more rapidly and conveniently. So um, there's a lot to be done to get the consumers to say, I am going to change. Because you know, a lot of people say consumers are extremely price sensitive to fuel, and they are. But you know, when I was with Nax, we did surveys of consumers for five years. And every time we asked them, well, what price would you dramatically change your behavior, seek alternative to driving? It was always more than I'm paying now. And usually 25 to 30 cents more. And that number went up with the price of fuel and it went up and down. There's always a delta there. And so it's, they're not going to change behavior because the price of fuel goes up. They're going to change behavior because the new option is superior in almost every way. And I don't think we're there yet. No, and I would say that is something I think you'll you'll notice a shift in light duty electric vehicles. It's very clear. Um, some of the early ones, the Volt, the Leaf, they really were advertised as efficient and green. Mm-hmm. Look at the newer ones, the the Lightning truck, the Hummer, the Mustang Mach E. They're marketed as performance machines, right? So they're people aren't really buying these necessarily because they're going to save money or save greenhouse gases. They're driving them because they have low zero to 60 times. They're fun. Yep. Um, and the prices are starting to become competitive. So on the light duty, uh, I would say a little bit of the shift has moved to the, towards that. On the heavy duty, I want to say we don't know yet because not enough people have done it. Not enough fleets have shifted over. Um, Long haul cross country is a really, really tough one. Cause as you mentioned, you have refueling times, you have range. The drivers don't even want to stop every 300 miles to refuel. Right. Um, and if, when they do stop, they sure don't want to stop for hours. Um, they want to stop for, you know, several to 10 minutes. Uh, but on some of the smaller fleets and um, maybe some of these more regional like buses is a perfect example. The uh, new administration really wants to push electrification of buses. Mm-hmm. Some of the feedback that we've gotten before is people <clears throat> love the electric buses because driving them is much, much more comfortable for the driver. It doesn't have this, and riding in them, it doesn't have the herky-jerky motion. We've all been in the uh, the rental bus coming from the airport, and it's, yeah. just, it's such a horrendous ride. It feels like every time the person shifts, you're getting you know, your teeth chattered. Right. Uh, so there, there's some advantages there where actually then people start to see other intrinsic value uh, to the technology. But like you said, it's it's not clear yet, and that's one reason we have to do a lot of research in this technology. We also have to bring the cost down on the technology. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that's a big initiative that's just announced um, today, actually, is the government announced about two hundred million more dollars to push um, further technologies for electrification. And one of the big problems with electrification, this is during a roundtable, talking about where are we going to make batteries, where are we going to get the materials for batteries, These such a, things such as rare earths. Um, we currently import a lot of them from mm-hmm. not necessarily always the most reliable sources. So the, the government, this is a good role for the government, though. It's a national uh, initiative, and it's not anything that any individual company can take on. So um, we're pretty lucky at Argonne. We get a chance to actually participate in this um, because we're a national lab. We're not a for-profit machine looking to make a product or make money. Yeah. And I think that kind of research is important. People ask me all the time, I give presentations and people say, well, what about the bad chemicals that are in the batteries? Isn't that worse than anything? And my response has always been the battery chemistry and composition is going to change. It's going to evolve. It's going to get better. The amount of money being invested in battery research necessitates that we're going to have some different composition going forward that is more quote, sustainable than what we're dealing with now. Um, so it's really exciting. Everything you guys are doing at Argonne, where can people go to learn a little bit more if they have interest in some of the projects you guys are doing? Yeah, so uh, our website is actually pretty easy to remember. It's, if you remember, Argonne National Lab, anl.gov. And if you want to go to my division, Energy Systems, put a slash ES. So anl.gov slash ES will bring you to Energy Systems. Um, right off the bat, you'll see plenty of cool pictures, including um, the old standbys looking at fuel sprays for internal combustion engines. Let's not forget, <laughs> they're not all away. Uh, no matter what everyone thinks, the, the U.S. government has not thrown in the towel. They're not giving up research on um, internal combustion engines. 
we're not firing all of our researchers that worked on the turtle combustion engines. Um, we actually hired some recently. So there still is work, uh, even though we talked a lot about hybrid and electrification, there's a lot of work to go on a turbo combustion engine, especially on the larger applications. You know, we still want to make them cleaner, still want to make them more efficient. Uh, another one just today I heard GE just announced a uh, next generation aviation engine, 20% more efficient. Something people thought wasn't possible. Yeah. So yeah. there is still a lot of exciting technology out there um, across the board. And some of it's from liquid fuels. Some of it's from fossil based liquid fuels, believe it or not, still, but that's the truth. And we're going to have combustion engines on the road for 50, 60, 70 years, no matter how fast electrification progresses. So making improvements to those now is important. Steve, you know, having you on the board at the Fuels Institute helps make the Institute better, helps us uh, focus our research on areas where we can make a difference and not duplicate other people are doing. So thanks for joining us on Carpool Chats and uh, hope to see you soon. And for all of you guys back home, thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next Carpool Chats.